Hello, Glenn Porter here, and today's lecture is on photographic perspective. I guess there's three critical creative concepts that we need to consider when we're practicing photography. The first one is the lighting, and your assessment is based around this concept of exploring this, this notion of essence of lighting rather than illumination. It's not about illumination, it's about this quality and this creative essence of lighting. So lighting plays a very critical part in the, create, the creative aspects of building an image. Composition or the way you compose the photograph is another critical creative concept. We've provided some insights or some guidelines into compositional elements and principles. However, a lot of it comes from the gut and your your ability to be able to connect with subjects. It's also equal with your ability to connect with lighting. It's a it's it it's a perceptive, uh, intuitive connection that you have with lighting in photography. It's not one that you can analyze too much. Although when we're working in the studio, we do do a lot of analytics associated with the lighting and the lighting quality, and change light shapers to change different uh, levels and aesthetics of lighting but it still really is this gut feeling this intuition connection with lighting and with composition the way you compose images you can't really think about it too much it's got to come from the gut it's got to come from the, the, the your feelings uh, inside it's got to be internal not external so comp but composition certainly p plays a critical component in the success of creative images the third creative concept is perspective, and that's what we're going to talk about in today's lecture. Now, some would say perspective is a component of composition, but I would argue against that. I think perspective is too big a deal. It's too big a concept to be a subsection within composition. And what we're going to do in today's lecture is unpack that complexity. Perspective is the ability to provide an image in a two-dimensional format from a three-dimensional subject. So this two-dimensionality is a really critical component of how we need to learn how to deal with that in photography. Dealing with the two dimensions from a three-dimensional world. So what I'll do today is kind of unpack what this concept means. We'll talk about how to control perspective but more importantly, what I'm hoping you'll get out of this lecture is a change of attitude, a change of thinking in the way you might approach the subjects. My standpoint for perspective is that you must know what type of perspective before you actually even start approaching subjects. So this perspective or the type of perspective comes first, then the composition and composing of the image comes second. That might be a a difficult concept or an ad abstract concept for you to understand at this moment but by the end of this lecture or it might take a couple of viewings of this lecture to fully understand understand the concept that I'm trying to convey here but it's a very important one that you not you in, certainly internalize perspective like you do with the other two but your instincts will tell you will enable you to make a decision on what type of two dimensionality you want before you actually get the camera out of the camera bag. All right, so let's have a look at now what this concept of perspective means. Now, this is a quote I borrowed from a painter, and I think it kind of represents the concept of perspective very well. And obviously painting is also a two dimension medium. So their pa uh, painters and artists are painting from real subjects, most likely from real subjects, and producing a two-dimensional representation of those or, in, or interpretation of what he or she sees. So I'm going to give you a bit of time to, to read that quote because uh, I won't read it out. You can, you can read. Now, the person that I borrowed this quote from, you may have heard of him or his work, Leonardo da Vinci. 
So this is not a modern concept. It's a concept that's been around for quite a few centuries, certainly way before photography ever got a Guernsey into the visual arts world. But there are three critical elements that da Vinci proposes here. He talks about perspective being divided into three parts, and those three parts are size, colour and shape, and the ability to diminish those concepts within the frame, or in Leonardo's, da Vinci, in Leonardo's world on the canvas. So I guess perspective can be described in Leonardo's definition that it's about diminishing size, diminishing colour and diminishing shape. So how does that play out in photography in a modern technological world and art form? Here we have one of Leonardo's uh, well-known paintings, frescoes, The Last Supper. And we can see some of these elements that Leonardo was referring to in his own work. So we can see diminishing shape of those square uh, doorways, or I'm not sure what they what they what they represent, whether they're openings. But you can see that they're diminishing in size and they're diminishing in shape. We can see through this aerial perspective, through this shade and color, that the back the back wall is darker than the the wall to the right. So we get and we're getting this shading happening on that right hand wall so it's diminishing in color the windows in the background are quite small compared to the subjects in the foreground and certainly the landscape projected through those windows are diminished in size compared to the the, the people sitting at the last supper table so there we have one of da Vinci's um, uh, works of art that's showing some of the, those three elements the concept of perspective in art has been around for quite a few centuries. Plato recognised this in some of the some of his writings, and he describes uh, Agathos's work, a fifteenth a fifth century artist, as having this wonderful natural three D quality, and referring to the the concept of perspective. David Hockney, in his research on the application of camera obscura in painting saw a, a, a dramatic shift in the 1400s, the 15th, the 15th century, into this more three-dimensional perspective of portraiture. What's interesting is this concept of perspective and in the Renaissance, in the 15th century, the artists weren't just artists, they were great intellectual people as well. So this exploration of perspective really started to resonate in the Renaissance. Hockney claims that this is mostly due to the influence of the camera obscura. So we don't have photography per se yet because we don't have a, a mechan mechanism to record the, the, the image in, in the back of a camera. But there were lenses and mirrors that could actually produce images. And throughout the Renaissance, these artists were also technical people. They were, they would use the most, the, the most modern technology and the most modern techniques for in, within their artwork. So Hockney claims that it's just natural that, with the technology of optics really starting to blossom within the 15th century, that painters and artists would actually explore that technology for their art. Hockney also claims that through 19th century art history, which was developed a lot later, centuries after the Renaissance and, and the recognition of, of art, that photography was kind of written out of the history quite deliberately in a, in a political way because of its threat to more traditional visual arts like painting. And I guess that some of that's true because when the, uh, the 19th century Western art historians were building this notion of history around art, they were not only categorising different visual art forms, they were also producing some hierarchical type aspects of the arts and painting was right up the top. Whereas a, a more modern concept now, and 
a lot of modern scholars like David Bates, Hugh Moss, they're suggesting that the image is actually central now to most contemporary visual art forms. And I, 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 I certainly do agree with that. So the, the phobia about photography going to take over painting has, has completely gone in a 21st century model. Although it's interesting, some scholars do still, still present this paranoia about photography. But in the Renaissance, the concept, and I think through the investigation through Camera Obscura and the formation of images in these devices, that the modern technology of the time was really looking at trying to unpack this concept of the image and certainly unpack the concept of perspective that was presented by these images in the camera obscuras. So we see a lot of evidence of this in paintings, like the one we see on the screen. This is a really overt demonstration of the artist considering perspective. So in the foreground we have have these, uh, and it's a biblical, it's a biblical painting as well, which is part of a lot of the tradition of the Renaissance still. So we've got these foreground figures that that are quite large compared to the the other line of figures um, within the background. So we have that change of size, that diminishing size. The courtyard itself has these lines, these linear lines that are diminishing in size or shape as they get further away from the viewpoint of the artist. But that grid pattern is quite an overt demonstration of the artist's ability or concepts associated with perspective. This is an overt message about perspective, saying that I am a modern painter, I am a modern artist, and I understand this philosophy and concept of, of perspective. We can see it also in the buildings portrayed in the background. When you compare the size of the foreground subjects, they're around about the same size as the buildings in the background. Now we know that's not true scale perspective, but then when you compare the, the other people in the background to the buildings, particularly those people in the far back, um, or just, just, just near that um, far back wall, you will see that they're very small. So compared to the, to the buildings, there's a correction of that perspective. So perspective really took ground in the Renaissance in the 15th century and painters were actually painting these concepts uh, overtly. Leonardo da Vinci uh, didn't do this type of painting, although he did examine it and you can, can see evidence of, of this type of work in da Vinci's, da Vinci's paintings. So let's unpack Leonardo's three definitions of perspective from a photographic perspective now, from a from modern technology. This is one of Michael Kenner's works, and we can see the a diminishing of size. This is also referred to as lineal perspective, where you have a repeat of an, uh, an a subject, an object. Power lines, you see this quite a lot, where you have a diminishing in size and space according to the, 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 dist the distance. But these trees are planted at the same space. They are roughly the same size, but the two dimension, two dimensional representation of that shows them that they're diminishing in size, but also the distance between each tree is actually reducing. Diminishing color. So this is not a color photograph, but it's showing that concepts of sh uh, diminishing shade. So different shade values and aerial perspective. Another word for this is aerial perspective, where we have atmospheric conditions that are producing this variation of shade or variation of color in the image. As this variation diminishes, this variation of tone or variation of color diminishes, it produces the illusion of perspective. and diminishing shape. This is one of Arge's photographs and we can see that pathway now starting to, we know that it's parallel lines, but 
the way they're reproduced in a two-dimensional medium is that they converge. So the shape of that pathway is actually diminishing as it gets further away from the camera. These are fairly logical things, but the way to unpack it is to look at this type of concept. So if we compare those three principles um, side by side, diminishing size, we can see now the flagpoles are diminishing in size. And again, that distance between the flagpoles is changing. Diminishing color and diminishing shape, that previous shot we saw of Arge. Now, the interesting thing about the word or the term perspective is that we use it in different ways. Perspective can also mean viewpoint. My perspective on composition, or meaning my viewpoint on composition, or my perspective on photography is my opinion or viewpoint. Perspective can be also the camera angle. So from a bird's eye perspective, from a low perspective, from a high perspective, and so forth. So the perspective does mean all those elements as well, but that's not what we're talking about in this lecture. We're talking about the transition between three-dimensional subjects to two-dimensional medium. But what's interesting with these th three images, they're three images of the same subject, the Empire State Building in New York, in the United States. And we can see a very close distance perspective down from the ground looking up. We can see that diminishing in, so in shape and in, in line. We have a more moderate perspective from a moderate distance in the middle. And then we have a very flat perspective taken at a greater distance by Andreas Feininger. So we're going to actually look at this differences now through several images. But you might want to refer back to this, these three images at some stage when you're trying to unpack and understand what perspective means. These are three images with three different perspectives. Now, I think Leonardo's definition is spot on, but let's put it into a modern context, I guess, for photography. My rather crude definition of perspective is the perception of space caused by the size relationship of the foreground and background subjects. Now, I, I will admit it's a lot more than that, but I just want to use that definition in the way to teach you how to see perspective. So photographic perspective is the perception of space caused by the size relationship of the foreground and background subjects. Now that variation of size relationship is caused by the transition between the three dimensional object when we reproduce it, reproduce it into a two dimensional medium. So let's have a look at what that definition means. Okay, so I guess this is a rather overt application of that meaning. So we have a, a, a figure in the foreground and we have the space shuttle on a plane in the background, lots of people in the middle. But if you compare that to the image I showed you of the artist with the quite overt painting, it, this, is, this has a lot of similarities to that actual original painting. We have the person in the foreground quite large, the people in the mid, mid ground quite small, and then the subject in the background quite small compared to this the foreground subject. So we have kind of a distortion of size. If we took a ruler, ruler to this uh, photo and measured the size of the person in the figure in the foreground and compared it to the size of the space shuttle, we would see that they're probably similar in size if not the figure is larger. Now we know that's not true. We know that that's not the reality, but it is the fact, the, the factual elements of the two dimensional medium, if we were to measure it in that linear way. But just to reinforce that definition that I produced earlier, it's the size relationship between the foreground subject, in this case, the figure and the background subject, which is the space shuttle and the plane and the people surrounding the, um, the space shuttle. And this is a slightly different image in the sense that there's not much foreground and background figure to kind of work out, except the only subject that we see is that black road. But if we look at the foreground of that road compared to the, the same road in the background, 
we can see that the size relationship has changed quite quite dramatically. One of Stephen Shaw's images of a building uh, with a mount, mountain background. Now, when you look at the two-dimensional representation, the building's around about the same size as the mountain. Well, that's not act, that's not true. That's not true in reality, but representationally, it's true in the photograph. But the size relationship now between the building and the and the mountains is a component of the perspective. Diane Arbus's image of the uh, the child with a hand grenade in Central Park, 1962, shows this size relationship as well. So the central figure, the centre of interest, the boy with the uh, toy hand grenade is quite large in the frame compared to the people walking towards the camera on the pathway in the background. So that physical size is, is quite different. Now what this size relationship also does to our image is it creates an artificial depth. The smaller people in the background look further away from the camera than the boy in the foreground. And that's 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 true. I mean they we we can interpret that that, that is quite accurate. But if they are the same size that distance between the foreground subject and the background subject wouldn't be apparent. But it but it is in this concept of perspective. So one of the other things that we see in perspective is the Z axis, which is depth, is artificially increased by this use of perspective. OK, so what we're going to do is define or, or categorize perspective. And we're going to categorize them in three different types, deep perspective, standard perspective, and flat perspective. So we're going to look at some examples and uh, explain how that how different images can fit into that, those three categories. We'll also talk about other concepts associated with perspective called true scale perspective and perspective distortion. But the three types of perspective categories that we apply in our photography is deep, standard, and flat perspective. So this image by Annie Lipovich demonstrates deep perspective. So we have a repetition uh, compositional element happening with the stairwell. But what we can see is that that stairwell is diminishing in size as it gets further away from the camera. So it's it has a sense of depth within the image. You can get, even though it's a two dimensional representation, as, as we all know, there is a sense of a, quite a, a large space, spatial aspect between where the photographer is viewing the, the, the subject and that subject right down below in the, on the ground floor of the, of the hotel. So deep perspective has this exaggerated sense of spatial elements within the photograph. Another uh, image by Lipovitz. Uh, Meryl Streep and we can see that Meryl Streep is quite large in the frame compared to the buildings on the left. Now we know that's not quite true but what it also does is create this sense of perspective of depth. So we can get this sometimes quite exaggerated uh, aspect of depth and Meryl Streep might be a lot closer to those buildings than, than what it actually looks in the image. So you can actually exaggerate or stretch that concept of that X, sorry, Z axis or depth within the two dimensional, two dimensional medium by exaggerating this, this type of perspective. So those buildings may not be as far away as they look, but the, the point to this image is that that perception of depth is certainly presented in the way the size relationship between the foreground and background subjects are represented. Dorothy Lang's uh, image in 1938, we can see the same, those same elements happening with this roadway, like the previous one. So as the road gets further away from the camera, it reduces in size and ends up going, uh, converging to a, to, a, to a single point, which is called a vanishing point. But what this photograph has done with those diminishing size and shape elements, if I can quote Leonardo, 
is that it produces this feeling of deep space within the image. So a three dimensionality uh, within this image, that vanishing point, that vanishing point on the horizon looks a long, long way away. So that's what perspective does. It controls this virtual uh, or perceptual space within the image as well. Andreas Feininger's uh, work here with some of the trains, I think it's New York City, and we can see the buildings in the background, but that lovely sense of depth that's running down along those carriages uh, and ending at those buildings in the background. There is a wonderful sense of depth within this photograph. Another Dorothy Lang image where we have now the foreground subjects quite large in the frame compared to the ones in the background. This is part of her sharecroppers uh, documentary work, beautiful work that uh, Lang has actually produced. And especially that symbolic image, uh, migrant mother, which I think I'm going to show in a moment. But we have a couple of elements happening here to create that depth of space. So the roadway is diminishing in size. That, that size is diminishing, converging to that vanishing point, but also the figures are reducing in size as well. So we kind of have two elements of diminishing size in this image, but it does create that sense of deep space. Loretta Lux, I almost took this one out, this image out. It's a beautiful image. I love the, love the color. The colors is fantastic. And I'm really a fan of Lux's work. And I guess the perspective here is the size of the foreground subject compared to that um, stone wall in the background. There's quite a, a large sense of depth. But I have to admit, Lux, these, these are very manipulated images. So um, the girl and may not have been photographed in this scene added on to the, on, these are two, probably two images combined. So it's not a true sort of photographic perspective in the sense that it's a natural, unedited uh, image. It's a highly manipulated image, but nevertheless, whether it's manipulated or whether it's natural, it doesn't really matter. The same concept of perspective are being presented here. Pisani's image, again, of the roadway, we have that conversion of the roadway, the, a very popular theme in, in perspective and creating this sense of depth. But we've also got the car bonnet, the size of that car bonnet in relation to the building. The building is only a, a half the size of the bonnet, but we do know the building is larger. So we have that size relationship difference, several, several elements of diminishing size here. Uh, but a lovely sense of depth in the image, lovely sense of mood and lighting as well. It's a quite a beautiful image. Brett Weston's image here, instead of having a roadway, now we have a canal and we have the same kind of principles, but a very deep perspective. But we've also got a few things happening here according to Leonardo's definition. So we have diminishing size of the, of the waterway, but we also have diminishing size. If you look at the top of the tree, and the bottom of those trees on the right hand side, they're converging like the road, but they're converging now in a vertical format rather than a horizontal format. But we're getting that convergence of size and distortion of shape or diminishing of shape happening with those trees as well. In addition to the, the atmospheric conditions, we're getting that change of tonality due to the mist or the fog rolling in the background. So we have a diminishing color in Leonardo's definition, but we can convert that to tone and or a diminishing shades of gray in black and white image. So we have several elements um, at play here, according to Leonardo's definition too. Now the opposite to deep or exaggerated perspective is flat or compressed perspective. So if you look at this shot, you can see it's out of focus, but the background is quite large in comparison to the foreground subject. So the foreground subject and the background subject or the size relationship between those two elements are not as exaggerated. And what that does is actually compress the space, make that distance between the background and the foreground uh, less, uh, less expansive or, or, or flat. And we see this type of flat compression a lot in sports photography, like the one we're seeing in the motor racing here. 
So this is another sports photograph of the cricket. And we can see that the size relationship now between the foreground, the, the batsman and the fieldsman is not too different. There's, a, there's certainly a, a difference of sharpness and selective depth of field is kind of an important technique to use in this type of perspective because you want to separate the subject from the background. But if you look at the size relationship between the batsman and the and the uh, fieldsman, or even the fieldsman and the people in the crowd, they're relatively the same size. So the the illusion or the perception of space between the batsman and the crowd is quite compressed. I hope you can see that that the the spatial elements are now quite flat or compressed in this image. So selective depth of field is becomes very important uh, technique in these type of images because you want that the batsman to stand out from the crowd. You don't want the batsman to blend in to the to the spectators in the background. So selective depth of field, a shallow depth of field is used to, to do that. But from a perspective perspective, from a perspective perspective, that's a silly way of saying it. But from the from the perspective side of things, the size relationship between the foreground and background subject is not hasn't changed a great deal or not changed at all. And you can see this with uh, Ansel Adams shot. Uh, the, the comparison between the, the foreground subjects, the buildings and the mountain is probably more realistic, but the mountain seems to be a lot bigger than the buildings. Now, if you compare that to the Stephen Shaw image I showed before, you would notice that in Shaw's image, the building looked the same size as the mountains, where in Adam's images, image, image here, the buildings look a lot smaller than the mountain. And this is a difference between perspective. So this is flat perspective or compressed perspective and Stephen Shaw's was, was exaggerated or deep perspective. So the size relationship between the two subjects, background and foreground subjects, is different in this case to the previous Stephen Shaw image. So deep perspective and flat perspective are on opposite sides of the perspective um, scales. In between those two types of perspective is standard perspective. Standard perspective gets its name from by using a standard lens. But we'll talk a little bit more about that later. But standard perspective is said to be similar to our eyes as well, uh, similar to our human vision. And But but it really is just a our human vision doesn't see things in two dimensional. So I, I kind of reject that notion that photographs have a similar way of looking at things to, to human vision, because it, it doesn't. We see in 3D, photos are in 2D. Maybe in 3D virtual reality, that might be true, but certainly not with standard photography, in my view anyway. But standard perspective is, there's a lot of literature that suggests that it's very similar to our human vision, but I reject that notion. I guess the only thing I really want to say about this type of perspective is that it is in between the two exaggerated forms. Um, the size relationship between background and foreground subjects still exists, but not 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 highly exaggerated, and they are they are still different. Cartier Bresson is well known for his ability to well his work shooting with a 50 mm lens, a standard lens. He used this standard perspective, which is quite different to more contemporary photojournalists and humanist photographers. And we'll explore that a little bit with photojournalism, the application of perspective in photojournalism in a moment. This is the image I referred to before by Dorothy Lang, my mother, probably one of the best, certainly in the top 10 documentary photographs ever produced, I think. David Moore's photograph of nuns at Sydney Airport. And Michael Kenner kind of breaks the rules a little bit with landscape photographs. Kenner works within the concept of high graphic quality in his landscape work. And the way I see his work, I see him using this standard perspective as a way of it, um, making better use of the graphic elements. So 
it's a, it, it is a really nice way of uh, emphasizing graphic elements within I mean we're shooting really here in a minimalist sense so to exaggerate the graphic qualities line shape form so forth um, a standard perspective allows you to exaggerate that a little bit more so you can be more you can have more of a graphic quality same, same with even flat perspective you can emphasize the graphic quality a, a lot more than deep perspective so you see this in Kenner's work here in this minimalist reproduction of a pine tree so a flatter or a more standard perspective is helps you to produce this type of making a really overt statement about the graphic qualities of the composition all right so we've seen now some examples of three different types of perspective deep standard and flat perspective but let's have a look at how we control perspective in our own practice how do we use those concepts how do we apply those concepts in our photography so what we've got on the screen at the moment is four images uh, four images I've shot just for for this lecture so we have our size relationship between the foreground and background subjects that's my definition of perspective that's the one that I want you to be critical of in these in these images so here we have four images the grave headstone is the foreground subject and the background subject is the little church in the in the background in the cemetery so the question I propose to you is that are these the same or are they different perspectives remember the definition size relationship between the foreground and background subjects now what you might notice is that in the 300 millimeter lens and these lenses were shot with a 35 mil format or a full frame digital SLR camera because why I say that is because the standard lens in a 6x6 format is an 80 millimeter lens in a 35 millimeter camera it's a 50 millimeter lens in a 4x5 inch format camera it's a 150 mil lens but usually we refer to focal length and standards by the 35 mil format which is a full frame digital SLR camera so the lens categories on the 24 millimeter lens is a wide angle lens the 50 mil lens is a standard lens a 150 millimeter lens is a short telephoto lens and the 300 millimeter lens is a longer telephoto lens the shots that we saw of the cricket were probably around about a 800 or even a 1200 millimeter uh, uh, focal length of lens so the question I propose to you is do these four images represent different perspectives and the answer is yes of course they do because if we see the size relationship between the in the 300 millimeter lens image the the headstone is significantly smaller than the church in the background in the 150 it's probably around about the same size the headstone in the church if you, from the gable top of the gable to the to the bottom it's about the same size in the 50 millimeter lens the church is significantly smaller than the headstone roughly about half the size of the headstone and in the 24 mil lens image the church is significantly smaller than the headstone so the definition of size relationship between the foreground and background subject it's quite clear that these four images represent different image perspectives what you might also see in these four images is that perception of depth is actually varying so in the 300 millimeter lens the depth the distance between the church and the headstone appears to be a lot less it's a flatter perspective compared to the 24 millimeter image that church seems to be further away because of that size relationship between the foreground and background subjects the church seems to be further away than the headstone as we know they haven't changed the distance between the headstone and the church remains the same in these four images okay so with that view in mind that analytical side of an analyzing these image perspectives we agree that they're different perspectives so what is the variation that's 
cause this change of perspective. So what you may note is that they're shot with different focal length lenses, 300 millimeter, 150 millimeter, 50 millimeter and 24 millimeter. So the variable of these images is quite clearly the focal length of the lens. Yeah, so the focal length of the lens. So one hypothesis could be to change perspective, we change the focal length of the lens. Now, I, I just want you to write on a piece of paper on your, on, your, on your lecture notes that we provide, whether you agree with that hypothesis or you don't agree. So yes, I agree. No, I do not agree. So I hope you got that answer down, because let's look a little bit more critically at that hypothesis. Now I've got another two images on the screen now. So the, the previous 300 millimeter lens image and a different image, an 80 millimeter image or an image produced by an 80 millimeter lens. Now these images were actually photographed at the same distance. I framed the, the image up with a 300 millimeter lens and this is what you'll be doing in your uh, tutorial uh, whether, whether if you're an external student, uh, we'll provide you that with the tutorial notes to do at home or in class with the internal students. So you set up, so I set up the camera with 300 millimeter lens and I framed the foreground and background subject. That's the result there on the left hand side. Camera was on a tripod. I took the 300 mil lens off and replaced it with an 80 millimeter lens and shot the same subject. So now we have two variations. So now we only have one variation, focal length of the lens, 300 millimeter lens. And at the same distance, we have an 80 millimeter lens. Now what's resulted in that change of focal length is obviously size because 80 millimeter lens, things get smaller and we get a, it's a wider angle. It gets angle of view increases. So we've got further subject matter to the left and right of the subject and so forth and more foreground more background but the question is has it changed perspective so have a look at that have a look at these two images and see whether you can analyze whether this is different perspective or not okay so let's look at this in a slightly different way what i'm going to do is crop the 80 mil image up to, so, so it's almost replicating the 300 mil image, uh, the 300 millimeter framing. Okay, so it's got a little bit fuzzy because it's a lot, a big crop. It's got, it's lost a little bit of resolution. But now what I've done is, is enlarge the 80 millimeter lens just by cropping up to around about the same size as the 300 millimeter lens. Now I'll ask you the same question again. Is there a change of image perspective in these two images? Hmm, bit of a conundrum here now. We've actually uh, have no difference in image perspective. The definition, the size relationship between the foreground and background subject means that the actual size relationship between that foreground and background subject of each shot is the same. So despite being shot with a different focal length lens, we actually have the same perspective. So our earlier, earlier hypothesis that focal length changes perspective has now been dispelled. Focal length does not change image perspective. So if you wrote, yes, I agreed, you were wrong. If you wrote, no, I disagree, you were correct in my earlier hypothesis. So 300 millimeter lens, we have a certain perspective, certainly a flat perspective. In the 80 millimeter lens, we also have that exact same flat perspective. So focal length does not change perspective. This question gets most people that I lecture this content to. They, and a lot of the literature that you might read in some of the more sort of amateur type basic photography books will say that perspective is changed by focal length. It's, it's not correct.
Okay, so here we have our three earlier, uh, sorry, four earlier images. And the hypothesis was proven that these focal length, the variation of focal length change perspective. But there was something I didn't add to the variation. I said the variation was focal length, and that was true, change the lenses. But there was another variation that I didn't allude you to, and that was distance. These images, when I change lenses, I also move the camera closer to the subject. So there are two variables, focal length and U distance. U distance is the distance between the subject and the camera. Okay, so pers the perspective laws. Perspective is altered by a change in camera distance only. Perspective is not altered by lens focal length. You change the lens, you don't change the perspective. If you have a zoom, a 24 to 150 millimeter zoom, for example, if you're standing in one one area and then you go from 24 mil to 150 mil, it's not changing the perspective. It's changing the size of the subjects. They get reduced as they as you decrease the focal length and and magnify as you increase or zoom in on the image. So the size of the subject the overall magnification of the image certainly changes, but the perspective doesn't. However, focal length does have a relationship to perspective because camera distance is actually determined or controlled by the lens focal length. And that's the key point. That's one of the key points of this lecture is that when you decide what type of perspective you want, you have to determine what distance you need to be shooting at. Now, what will determine what distance you shoot at is the lens focal length. So if you want deep perspective, you have to get in really close. If you're getting in really close and your subjects are quite large, you might need a short focal length lens to fit them into the frame. If you want really flat perspective, you have to get further away. But as you get further away, your size of your subject gets smaller. So you might need a longer focal length to increase that magnification so you can frame your subject in the frame too. So camera distance is controlled by lens focal length, but lens focal length doesn't control perspective, but it has an indirect relationship. So the three categories of perspective is deep, flat, and standard. They're the three categories. This is not a different type of perspective. This is a con concept associated with how we use perspective in photography. And Andreas Feininger, in his Masters of Photography, I think it's a Masters of Photography interviews, shot in around the 1980s, early 80s, talks about this concept of true scale perspective and it is a very quite an insightful uh, insightful uh, talk about photography and the application of perspective i'm sure it'd be on youtube somewhere so see if you can dig it out andreas feininger's master of photography it was a bbc series uh, brilliant series uh, interviews of different photographers now if you look at the on the right hand diagram we can see three two-dimensional replications, repl uh, representations of a box. The first one is very deep perspective, so that vertical side closest to the camera, it's a line drawing, but you know what I mean, that one, that, that sort of vertical line closest to the, on the right-hand side is quite large. In a standard perspective, it's only a little bit larger than the the, the, the size of the or the, the diminishing shape is a lot less but on the bottom the representation is actually more of a true scale representation of the box so we've got three different perspectives but only one really has this notion of a true scale and that's the last one and this is what Feininger started to really explore with his photography he wanted to produce 
this concept of true scale perspective. The Empire State Building, which we saw this image before, the grandeur and scale and the majestic size of this building is massive. But when you photograph it close up from the street, it does kind of, I guess, look, look large, but you really need to compare it with something small to actually appreciate the size of the object. So what Feinang has done in this image has photographed the Empire State Building with regular size buildings in the foreground. And that gives you that sense of scale, that, that sense of true scale, that Empire State Building is huge compared to those apartment buildings and buildings in the foreground. You get that concept? So. So that's what fine angle was kind of exploring. Now, what you might notice is that there's a few other elements of perspective here, that change of atmospheric conditions, change of tonality, but it's also a very, but even that change of tonality, that change of, uh, of color, according to Leonardo, it still looks like a very compressed, a very flat perspective. And what would be the clue to his distance here? He's obviously shot this at a fair distance, so. So that distance has actually created this sense of perspective that he was after. So here's another uh, part of Feininger's work. And this is not to the true scale perspective. So this is kind of what he was arguing against in his original work. So we have, I think this is the Brooklyn Bridge. Could be wrong, I, I'm not quite sure. But the, the pylon and the in the foreground compared to the pylon in the background is quite a difference in size, even though we know they're the same shape, same size. We can see the buildings in the background. You can see the Empire State Building there as well. But the buildings in the background also appear to be a lot smaller than that foreground pylon, which is also not true, not true scale. Finding in his, in his uh, interview suggests that if you were on that bridge photographing the cars, the cars would look a lot bigger than the actual pylons, and that's not true scale perspective. So this is what Feininger was, uh, his work was fighting against. He, this is one of Feininger's work, works, which is kind of your typical landscape, cityscape type image, and that type of perspective. But Feininger was exploring something very different. This is a shot by David Moore of the uh, Sydney um, Harbour Bridge. And that point that Feininger makes in his interview is, is what we're trying to show here now. So the size of the cars, the cars look a lot bigger than those pylons in the background, although they're very much in the background. Uh, so, so it's a not true scale perspective. You know, that guy on the, the motorbike is almost as big as the pylon in the background. This is a portrait of James Nashway, a very well-known photojournalist. And we can see that same effect happening with this same bridge. So Nashway himself is a lot larger than those pylons on the bridge. That's not true scale perspective. It's a distortion of perspective. It's deep perspective as well. We can see that there's a sense of depth associated with the, the distance from the pylons to the subject too, which is what the photographer wanted in this case. The subject is the photographer, Nat, James Nashway, not the pylon. So the dominance is the is the subject matter. That was this is quite deliberate. But I'm the point I'm trying to make is that this this notion of true scale perspective and how most of the times we don't represent scale in a true form. These were two images that we saw earlier when I showed you the three images of the Empire State Building. Well, no, I don't think the one on the right was actually that same image, but very similar viewpoint, probably shot from the same building. So here we have that earlier Feininger image with the flat perspective showing true scale. The buildings in the foreground and the Empire State Building actually are represented two-dimensionally here in a true, true scale concept. Whereas Feininger's work on the right, the buildings in the background appear a lot smaller than the Empire State Building. And the reason why that is occurring is that Feininger in the in the right hand side image is a lot closer to the Empire State Building. So remember, perspective is controlled by distance. So the closer you go, the more exaggerated perspective you get, the further away you, you, you um, go from the subject, 
the flatter the perspective comes. So Andre Feininger's work on the left hand side is at a considerable distance, whereas the his, his um, other shot of the same subject, he's fairly close from a, an adjacent building in the Manhattan sky, skyline. So these two images, same subject, but showing totally different perspective. But Feininger's work on the left-hand side is, is also, and this is what Feininger's work is all about in this context, in this work, it's about that true scar perspective. This is another one of Feininger's true scar perspective images. Beautiful image. Now we've got lots of aerial perspective here with the fog and the mist and the the smoke coming from from the buildings. I, I think it's smoke. We have so a lot of aerial perspective, so diminishing in colour as according to Leonardo, but it's still a very flat perspective, very compressed. The spatial elements are very compressed, but it's true scale. So the rela size relationship between the uh, ferry in the foreground and the building is kind of true. We see the the cars in the in the background compared to the scale of the buildings is kind of true. So this is very, very much uh, clo or close to true scale perspective. Might not be 100% accurate. I don't think it is. I think those ferries might be slightly um, oversized if you look at the true scale perspective concept. But Feininger's work was all about trying to represent the skyline in its grandeur. It, he wanted to demonstrate the size. To do that, he had to use flat perspective. So he used flat perspective to exaggerate this concept of true scale. I hope that makes sense to you because what I'm alluding to is the consciousness of the photographer going out and shooting subjects to a particular perspective for meaning, for a meaningful or for a purpose, way, purpose perspective. He meant he wanted to show the grandeur and size of the buildings to show the the size of those buildings those skyscrapers he had to show true scale to to show true scale he had to use flat perspective to use flat perspective he had to use a very large distance now that causes a problem particularly when your subject is so big as these skyscrapers how far away do you have to be to a a huge size skyscraper to actually get true scale perspective well I can tell you a couple of kilometers it was quite a long distance and that now you've got a problem with well what focal length do you use what focal length lens do you use to shoot at half a kilometer one kilometer or two kilometers away from the subject um, you'll need a very long focal length lens and at the time that Andreas Feininger was shooting this he just couldn't go out and buy a 1200 millimeter lens they didn't exist then so what did Feininger do? Well, and you can see it in this shot too. You can see that kind of distance, even though it's flat perspective, you can see that Feininger is quite a, quite a long way away from the Empire State Building. So what type of focal length did he need to shoot this? Well, it would have been a, a, you know, a couple of thousand millimeter lens. No such thing as a 2000 millimeter lens in the days of of finding it. So guess what he goes and do, does? He goes and builds his own lens. So Andreas Feininger built his own lens to do this, this type of work. He had the perspective in mind that he needed for true scale perspective. The technology wasn't there, he couldn't purchase it. So he had to go and design it and designed it himself. Very innovative guy, uh, brilliant photographer. I think if uh, I could be wrong here, so don't uh, don't quote me on this, but I think it was a 25 inch lens that he built, 25 inches. I think it was 25 inches, and this is on four by five um, film camera. That image is of the lens that, that that he built. But so, what's the message here? The message to you is that understanding perspectives, perspective is part of how you approach subjects. It's not a consequence of the photograph. Perspective should never be a consequence of the, of the photograph. It should be a deliberate controlled act. 
that probably scares you uh, to think that you have to decide what type of perspective to use uh, before you actually get your camera out of the bag. But I'll show you some genres of photography and how they use perspective so that will become a little bit easier for you. Okay, let's have a look at another example of perspective and photographers approaches. This image by Arnold Newman of Igor Stravinsky. Stravinsky was a composer, shot in 1946. And this is probably one of Arnold Newman's, oh, certainly within the top five images, portraits that he's shot in his career. It was shot very early in Newman's career. And it shows a lovely sense of uh, composition with that musical shape, even though it's not true musical shape but that musical note shape of the grand piano lid and Igor Stravinsky uh, to the left of the uh, frame. That tonal variation in the background just really adds the, adds the image as well. But if you look at this image, it's quite flat in perspective as well. There's not much depth, not much depth at all. Now this is the proof sheet of this shoot by Newman of Stravinsky and in this proof sheet, this, these are four by five inch negatives. So they're quite large, 10 by 13 centimeters. And they're placed on a 10 by eight paper. This is how we used to proof, what we call proof um, film and proof our photographs to show the client. Now what you might notice in the images that, that you can see a lot more than the original photo. You can see the legs of the piano. You can see the the cornice work on the ceiling, even the skirting board on the floor as well. So it gives you a bit more perspective of a bit more understanding or a bit more viewpoint of the actual building and the location of the grand piano. But the bottom right hand image is the one that we saw before. Now in the interview in the 80s by of Arnold Newman, the interviewer asked Newman, well, if you look at the proof sheet, obviously you didn't see that sort of high graphic element of the original composition and you in, you in later on in the dark room, as opposed to one Photoshop, you crop that photograph in to, to dramatize the, the graphic elements of the work. So you didn't really see the, see that composition in the camera, but you improved upon it in the dark room by cropping because it's it's evident in the proof sheet that the framing of the camera is very different to the final framing of the image and the response of Newman to this question was remarkable he said no I shot this at the right perspective that I saw the image should be Unfortunately, as a young photographer, he didn't have a long, longer focal length lens. He used the longest focal length lens he had on his four by five camera and moved further away from the subject to flatten the perspective. He knew with a large format negative, he had a lot of room to crop, but what was important was getting the perspective on the film. Because you can't change perspective, well, you kind of can change perspective distortion uh, with Photoshop, but you can't change this spatial elements in Photoshop. It's got to be in camera. So this is another example of understanding perspective and approaching your subject to the perspective that outcome that you want, not just use the perspective that actually occurs as a consequence of the shoot. Newman knew he wanted a flatter perspective to exaggerate that shape of the piano lid. He knew he was going to crop out that extra material, the ex excess material of the, the legs and so forth. All that was actually going to go. But what was important was the flattening of the depth, exaggeration of that, of that piano lid note. The final result is an absolute masterpiece. But what's in the important message that I'm trying to get across to you guys now is that perspective needs to be within the framework of your 
photographic vision, not the consequence of the camera. Newman knew he wanted to flatten the perspective. He got as far back as he could, knew, knowing that he had to crop to get the result he wanted. Feininger's needed to get a long way away from the sky skyline of New York City. Knew he had to get further away, didn't have a lens to actually record it, so he built the lens. But both these photographers had the insight and the intuition of knowing what type of perspective they wanted right from the start. We'll show you some examples of photojournalism too, because photojournalism photojournalists also use this perspective in a very different way though. Now per perspective distortion is another concept associated with uh, perspective I guess and this difference between background and foreground subjects. I'm not going to elaborate uh, any more that we all know we all play these tricks with cameras all the time um, but that's what perspective distortion is that flattening of the space so I guess in a, in a say in a way it really is a gestalt it's using gestalt psychology more so than perspective and the both these images are looking at the gestalt concept of continuity and and proximity so it's a more of a gestalt rather than a perspective thing but the notion of these sort of trick photography if you like is uh, well known and you see it on Facebook all the time what we're going to do now is look at different perspective the application of perspective in different genres of photography now portrait photography is quite an important one particularly in the retail sector when you're trying to um, flatter the people in retail portraiture you're trying to make them look beautiful make them look pleasing make them look happy all these artificial notions of of our self-esteem and and image that we want to project out to society to record someone that's going to make them look more attractive rather than less attractive requires an understanding of perspective now if you look at these two images of, that you see on the screen now one's with a very deep perspective the other one's with a flat perspective now the deep perspective you can see the size of the nose uh, being quite exaggerated because that's closer so the size relationship between the nose which is the foreground subject and the ears is is quite different whereas in the in the right hand side image they're more normalized they're a more normal ratio so this is a series of six images I, I shot of one of my forensic science students a few years ago to show this concept of perspective distortion you can see on the bottom right hand side ones these ones are the much the much difference but these are all shot with different focal length lens at different distances but the controlling element is actually the distance you can kind of see this effect with these images this is some of my um, doctoral research uh, that I did a few years ago showing the differences between image perspective uh, with uh, facial features in this facial features was a concept of facial identification but we see on the left hand side image the size relationship between the nose or the size of the nose and the ear um, the nose is bigger than the ear slightly bigger than the ear in the center shot the ear and nose is roughly the same size but on the right hand side the ear is now significantly bigger than the nose so we've got different size relationship representations of facial features bigger nose smaller ear and to the other extreme bigger ear smaller nose now what's interesting is that these three subjects they're the same nose and the same ear they're exactly the same subject it's only image perspective that's actually changed so the basic fundamental concept of portraiture is not to exaggerate facial features is to make them more normalized so some key aims in the application of perspective in portraiture promote aesthetics and attractiveness of the sitter if they don't look good you're not going to sell um, photographs to them natural and realistic proportion so now when we're looking at size relationship between facial features we're looking at this concept of proportion and beauty now what's different to retail portraiture 
is another type of portraiture that's looking more out of portraiture as a study, as a social documentary, as a characterization of people's personality. And you might want to approach this type of portraiture in a different way to retail portraiture. Retail portraiture, you're trying to promote the sense of attractiveness and beauty. Character portraiture may not be the same. You're looking at more creative, more personality, and you might use a different type of perspective. You might get in closer to exaggerate those facial features. So in portraiture, it's not always one rule. It depends upon the type of genre of, of portraiture you're trying to promote. This is one of my images of Michael Keery, who's a ceramicist, ceramic artist, and this is shot with a very short focal length lens up very close. And you can see the, the doorway of his studio in the background quite small compared to the sitter. Another one of Arnold Newman's images, Pablo Picasso. This is another quite well-known image. And we can see a different type of approach with perspective with this one as well. But we're, we're trying to deal with a characterization of the person rather than a concept of beauty or attractiveness. This is a lovely image where Picasso's um, right eye, the left, the left eye, uh, the left hand side of the image, it appears to be looking at a different direction to the other eye. It looks like peering out where the where the hand is, which is characteristic of Picasso's work with this cubism type portraiture. In the genre of fashion and beauty photography, we now have a different set of circumstances as a fashion photographer or beauty photography is photography for makeup catalogs or um, images that are used in packaging of makeup and so forth here and that includes hair um, you know hair dyes and things like that you will get this type of image on the on the cover of the of uh, hair dye packaging in the supermarket but in fashion and beauty photography what we're doing now is we're actually using very expensive and highly attractive models. Now, there's, there's a lot of interesting concepts and theories about beauty, what, how to define beauty and so forth. And they're, they're quite interesting studies and certainly encourage you to go and read a few articles and scholarly papers around beauty because it, it is quite worthwhile investigating those concepts. But I just need to simplify that concept in this context for this lecture. And beauty in fashion photography and beauty photography is about proportion. Now, what makes a model uh, beautiful in a simplistic sense is that they have this concept of proportion. Their facial features are at a particular proportion. Now, there's been studies that suggest that they're, they're related to the golden mean or the Fibonacci sequence and and all, all, all those type of elements of beauty in nature. And, and, and I, I agree with that. I think that's, that's probably right. But for the point of the exercise of this lecture, it's just to consider that models have an inherent sense of proportion of their features. And that proportion has to be promoted. So if you're shooting a model in this type of image, you want to promote her or his sense of proportion. Now, do you remember what we were talking about with Andre Feininger's work about true scale perspective? So when you want to maintain true scale proportion, you have to use the same approach as Feininger. You have to use a perspective that's quite flat or a camera distance that's a long way away from the subject. So in fashion and beauty photography, we use a very flat perspective to maintain correct proportion of or the inherent beautiful proportions of these fashion and beauty models. So what photographers do in fashion and beauty photography, they shoot with a very long focal length lens at a greater distance to flatten that perspective and promote the sense of proportion. That enhances the concept of beauty. So all these shots that you see in Vogue and all the fashion magazines are all shot with that, with that notion, maintaining that sense of beauty of the subject.
Now in photojournalism, we're not about, it's not about beauty, it's about telling a story, having a visual narrative. Visual narrative is really the key point of photojournalism, telling a story with pictures. Now this image that I shot in China, I think about year 2000, I think it might have been, it's not a very good reproduction. I need to do another scan. It was scanned on a very old technology quite a few years ago. But what's interesting about this image is the way perspective is shot. Now in photojournalism and the way I approach this subject, I shot with a short focal length lens. In this case, it was a 20 millimeter lens on a 35 mil film camera. And I used a hyperfocal distance shot at F16 and I used the depth of field scale and a hyperfocal distance to focus. What that means is that I'm setting a depth of field um, from 0.8 or 1 meters away, everything's going to be sharp. So all I have to do is stand about 1 meter away from the subject and it's going to be sharp. It didn't have to focus the camera. So you can shoot very quickly. But let's look at the perspective here in photojournalism. We're telling a story. So one of parts of the story is context. So this is shot on a short focal length lens, but up really close. We've got a beautiful sense of uh, of scale and size diminishing of these these little kitties as they were walking up to me um, from the, the two kids in the foreground and that beautiful sort of size, diminish, diminishing size of those subjects gives it that lovely sense of depth. But what's also important is the environment that these people are, are living in. And this notion of the, the washing and the mum with the baby in the background, hanging the washing, doing the, the, the domestic chores and the children playing around in the, in the backyard. If I was to shoot this at a distance like Findinger's work with a long focal length lens, I wouldn't get the context of this image because it, while it comes in close to the, close to the subject and I can frame and crop the subject a lot, tighter. It doesn't allow that context. So what deep perspective does is photojournalism. It reduces the size of the background information. And by reducing the size of the background information, you get more information. By getting more information, you get more contextualization, more, more sense of the visual narrative. So we're not really after true scale perspective in this case. We're not really after a sense of promotion of beauty, but we're after a storytelling objective. So being able to produce an image that has a lot of contextual information in the background is really important to photojournalism. There's another really important element that we're going to talk about in a moment, and that is called, that is looking at the difference between a spectator and a participant's perspective. But I'll just leave that for now. At the so, so this is deep perspective, but it's deep perspective for the purpose of contextualizing the story with the background information. So we're reducing the size of the buildings, we're reducing the size of the information that's in the background, but that allows more information to make sense and, and contextualize the, the story that's being told. Now, the best way to understand this is by looking at this quote by Robert Kappa. Robert Kappa was a well-known war correspondent photographer and was killed in the in the 50s. But Kappa was one of the founders of Magnum, Magnum Photography, which is a probably the best known photo agency in the world and, and, and still today it's it's one of the most prestigious photo agencies to work for. Uh, Kappa was one of the founders with Cartier Bresson and a couple of others. Kappa's work and Cartier Bresson's work was in this era of picture post where photography, there were, there were magazines of, of, of uh, f um, photographic essays or visual narratives. So they were, they were picture, picture post was about, and life was about um, telling stories through, through imagery. And Kappa's quote is, if your pictures aren't good enough, you're not close enough. So many aspiring photographers who wanted to break into Magnum in its early stages, this is what Kappa would say to them. If your photographs aren't good enough, 
you're just not close enough. So what does that mean? You're not close enough. You're not filling the frame. It doesn't mean that you're not filling the frame or the pitch is too small, though it can it can do that as well in composition. It's But it, he's not referring to that. He's referring to the engagement of the spectator, the viewer of the image. And with war correspondence photography and a lot of other photojournalism, it's the emotional content that's also important. How do you portray in a still photograph emotion in your work? You do it by coming in close. And you do and by coming in close, you get this this concept of perspective, but you also get an engagement with the activity from the viewer. So we have two viewpoints. We have a spectator and a participant. And when you look at the different and go back and look at some of these other images that are that are presented in this lecture and also look at the that the deeper perspective the deep perspective images have a higher sense of engagement and connection and feeling that you're actually viewing and being a participant of the action rather than looking at it from a distance so that 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 flat or deep perspective also creates a sense of a virtual space of the viewer the the spectator the the viewer sorry I should say the viewer of the photograph can appear closer to the action or further away from a virtual in a virtual perspective you know, in a virtual sense by the camera distance as well so camera distance doesn't just change perspective it changes the the context of the viewer of the image, the context of whether they're engaging as a, as, a, as a participant or just viewing it from a distance as a spectator. And this is a quite a complex conceptual idea that I'm presenting here, but I'm hoping you're going to be able to understand that with a few more images. So uh, Nick Oltz um, photograph in the Vietnam War you can get this sense of drama and action and uh, emotion, this stress of this poor mother carrying the baby and the stress of the father trying to protect his child in the, um, just behind the woman there. Uh, that You get that, you feel that sense of anticipation that of the action. You get to feel, you, you get to sense the, the what's happening in this image because you feel like a participant in it. What Ult's done in this image has forced the viewer to become part of a participant by shooting this image close. So by shooting it close, you not only get the concept of deep perspective, you not only get the concept, now we have the, the grass hut in the background, we have the fence, we have the vegetation, we have a, the, the soldiers in the background, all that information contextualizing the image but there's also a really important other virtual space being presented, and that is the virtual space of the viewer. And by shooting close, the viewer gets the sense of being close to the action and starts to feel what's happening in the image. I know it's a really weird concept, this, but I really want you to open up your mind and really try to consider this because it's really important in, in the way you approach your subject matters and the way you project, um, use perspective in your work. This is, this is probably Robert Kappa's most famous image, Death of a Loyalist Soldier. And this is at the point where the soldier was killed in the Spanish Civil War. Kappa was a, was a, bit, of a, a bit of a cad, I think is, a, is probably a nice term for, for Kappa. Um, he loved gambling, he loved drinking, he loved women, he, he would go out on a shoot, make lots of money, then blow it on the horses, blow it on the nightclubs. He was an absolute disaster uh, of a human being there, but he's probably co compensating for the horrible things, the horrific things that he sees in war. But he was a real card, and uh, there has been a lot of criticism of this photograph, his most famous photograph, in the sense that it was faked or staged but that i don't really care about that um 
the death of a loyal soldier is Robert Kappa. But what, what he said about the photojournalism was quite a remarkable statement. Here's another one of Kappa's works, in close photojournalism type style of perspective. In close, engaging the, engaging the viewer of the photograph, placing context in the, in the image, the smoky buildings, rubble of the buildings, the, um, the, the, the site, the, the, the paratroopers, the paratroopers um, uh, parachute on the, on, the, on the top left hand side, some parachute on the, on, on the ground. You're getting that sense of contextualization where flat perspective of shot at a distance with a long focal length lens you don't get that you don't get that so in photojournalism and according to kappa if your photographs don't really have that emotional content it's because the this the viewer of the image isn't becoming a participant they're becoming a spectator so if, if they're not if they're not you're not engaging the the, the viewer you're just not close enough, so you've got to get in close to, to, to engage those viewers. Now, this is the uh, a sad photo because this was a photograph taken in Korea, I think it was, and uh, shot in 1954, pretty much moments before Kappa actually trod on a landmine and was killed. So this is the last photograph of Robert Kappa. So he did get too close to the war. I don't mean that in a jokey way, uh, but he was killed at this location just a few moments after he took this photograph. It's quite sad. All right, so here's another war correspondence photographer, David Burnett, American photographer. In nice and close, start to feel this emotion of this sitter. This is in Vietnam. Oh, one of my shots shot in the emergency room of a neonatal emergency room in really close to get that sense of care of the nurse. Also provides a lot of background context. You can see the instruments. This was shot in the uh, early 90s. So you can see the, the context of the emergency room, some equipment and so forth. But what I really like about it is the little logo on top of the uh, the, the sheet that's on the Humicrib or whatever that that article is. I think it's like a little heater and it says the, the the location of the actual hospital which is no longer a children's hospital. Love this shot by Gary Winogrand. I think this is Winogrand's best photograph and this is uh, I'll, I'll let you have a look at this in a moment and see whether you can determine what the narrative is in this photograph. What story is behind this image? I'll give you a clue. It's well, it's there on the screen. It's shot in 1964. It's shot in Dallas. And it's a image of the location where JFK was assassinated. So there you have the roadway, uh, the, uh, the car driving down the roadway, which is roughly where Kennedy was actually shot really close there. What's interesting in, in the background, just above the above the car uh, on that little fence there, that's the grassy knoll that you may have heard about or read about there where they, they, they suspect the conspiracy theorists think that it was the the execute, executor, executor or the assassin was actually located there, not behind the building which is what the lady's pointing to. The, the little postcard is the building on the sixth floor where Lee Harvey Oswald uh, fired the shots. So you've got that kind of reference to where where the, uh, the, the assassin was and these people trying to recreate it and that symbol of the, of the, of, of the camera, uh, just really great. But that, that um, what I mentioned before, that little wall above where that where that sign is, is where Abraham Sapruder was standing when he shot that footage of JFK's assassination, which is known as the Sapruder film. So we got really rich narrative happening in this shot. It's a really rich, uh, beautiful illustration of visual narrative in photojournalism. But Winograd, typical photojournalism style, wants you to engage in the conversation between these people. 
And how has he done that? He shot it in close. So lots of beautiful visual clues with the postcard, the camera, the car, the site where Zapruder was when he filmed, the grassy knoll, lots of other elements there that are really working. But Winograd really wants you to engage in this conversation with these people. So the camera is in close. We kind of mentioned this a little bit before about different applications of of sport with uh, different applications of perspective in sport and it's that very flat perspective that compressed perspective and you can see the the, dis the distance between these formula one cars and the crowd in the background appears very compressed very flat now what what i want you to also notice is this concept of that photojournalists use you know that quote you know got to be in close to engage the viewer. Now this isn't close, this is a distance. Can you get the sense now that you're not on the road, you're not in the car, you're not in the car next to one of the drivers, you do get a sense, a virtual sense of space, a distance between the subjects and the, and the viewer now. There is a, that virtual sense of spa a space. In this context, you become a spectator, not a participant. And that kind of works with sport photography because we we spectate at sport we don't participate but what you'll see in a lot of now television television uh, strategies now with sport is those cameras i think they call them spiders where they actually come down and film very close to the action of this of the spectators they're trying to get give you uh, a sense of being a participant rather than a spectator with that sort of strategy of filming. One of the problems with this compressed format is that it really slows down the sense of speed too. These cars are flying, are flying past, but they don't really get that sense of speed. One of the tricks that some sports photographers do with motorsport is tilt the camera a little bit so that the, the line is on a diagonal, which diagonal lines add the content, the concept of speed of motion and speed but we can see here again it's very flat but you do feel that you're at a distance but you can't really get close to the subjects although I'll reframe that a little bit again if you watch the formula one you'll see onboard camera action which gives you a sense of participant rather than spectatorship what was interesting when I was looking for sports photos, I'm not a sports photographer, but when I was looking for sports photos to include in this lecture, when I Google motor racing photos, what I was getting was a lot of this, this type of images. And th these are actually images just being taken off video games. So I, I, I was getting frustrated because every time I would type in or Google sports photography or cricket photography i would keep getting these these virtual uh, game uh, images not real sports photography but i but i looked at it and i went oh hang on what's what's happening here there's something very interesting happening psychologically here look at the perspective of this image this is just a computer game it's not a it has no basis of reality at all but it's deep perspective and i'm thinking why would they provide such a deep perspective what so what what is the motivation of the games designers to produce images in this deep perspective and it's quite obvious why that is that they want you to be a participant not a spectator they want you to be engrossed with the game and what's very interesting is by engaging like Kappa suggested with photojournalism to engage viewers of these video games you use a deep perspective because you want them to feel like participants not spectators you want them to feel inside the action not outside the action and I thought that was quite interesting so here's another image of a cricket game and we can see this deep perspective very different to the cricket images I showed you before shot by photographers okay so this has ended up being a rather long uh, lecture I, I hope it wasn't too dull but it really is quite critical that you start to understand how to use perspective you need to consider the subject matter and you need to plan or think about what type of strategy you're going to use with this two-dimensional representational perspective before you even 
go out to the subject before you take your camera out of the bag. When you're putting your different lenses into your camera kit to, to take out to a shoot, that decision of what lenses you're going to be using really should be about what perspective you're trying to produce. And I guess that's the key message here. Remember, focal length doesn't control perspective. Focal length controls distance and distance controls perspective. So let's just summarize some of the things we said today. Photographic perspective is a condition when three dimensional objects are transformed into two dimensional media. Consideration of photographic perspective must be conducted during image management, not through the viewfinder. And what I'm referring to there is the, you see this a lot with amateur photographers, the zoom in and zoom out mentality. They would get a zoom lens, and, and this is why I'm kind of anti-zoom lenses in a way. There's nothing wrong with zoom lenses, but the problem is, is how people use them. So they'll stand in a static in a spot and they, they're composing their images by zooming in, zooming out. That's the wrong approach. Totally wrong, totally wrong. It's about understanding what perspective you want and moving to the distance that you want to create that perspective. Then changing the focal length of the lens via the zoom to fit your composition based on the perspective you decided on. Remember, perspective should be a conscious decision, not a consequence of the photography. Become familiar with certain photographic perspective outcomes. If you're shooting fashion, if you're shooting beauty, if you're shooting retail portraiture, as opposed to characterizations of people, might want to approach it differently. Use photographic perspective to enhance visual communication, meaning and creativity. In photojournalism, we like to contextualize the viewer by showing more of the more of the um, environment. We're trying to get the viewer engaged by becoming participants, not spectators and so forth. So there's lots of things to consider with perspective. It's not just a consequence of what lens you've actually put onto your camera. Just a couple of things to finish up on. Henry cartier Brisson said, I'm a visual man. I watch, watch, watch. I understand things through my eyes. And that's a picture of Henry cartier Brisson with his camera up on his chest looking for the next image. cartier Brisson is absolutely right. It's, it's about seeing. Photography is about seeing. Understanding seeing is about understanding perspective. Now, what I've often heard photographers and people that write about photojournalism is the notion that the camera becomes the person's eye, the photographer's eye. And that's nothing further from the truth. The camera doesn't replace your eye. As a photographer, you have to see like the camera sees. And the camera can see things in different perspectives. Understanding those differences in perspective allows you to see like a camera. So cameras never replace the eye. Photographers have to see like a camera. Perspective is the key to understanding and unlocking this concept. The camera as an eye. Thanks very much. And I hope there was some insights there for you in your creative photography. And I'll talk to you soon. Bye-bye.